Welcome to Planetary Gig Talk, Tales of Music and Magic. I'm your host, Jefferson Glassy, Chief Spiritual Dude of the Planetary Gig Society, whose mission is creating unity through music. And today, uh, we're not in Studio One at the worldwide headquarters of the Planetary Gig Society. We are in Denver, Colorado, which is the uh, area where a great friend, fabulous guitar player, singer, fellow association executive, um, great guy, abides and calls home out in Colorado. Uh, I'd like to introduce Mr. Stan Orr. Hello, Stan. Good morning, Jefferson, and thanks for having me. Sure thing. Well, you know, you're the... Dr. Strum is your uh, <laughs> your name. Um, we we kind of had this little of the three co-founders for Planetary Gig Society, we, we all have a title just because, you know, why not? <laughs> it's kind of like a life title. You know, I don't, title. I, yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I didn't want to be vice president of accounting as my life title, so I need, need to do something like that. But it's great that you've taken the time to, to be here, and also uh, I want to thank you for all of your efforts um, on the board, uh, helping with the founding of the Planetary Gig Society, um, we, were, we had a great time. Uh, we sponsored Up With People. The gala last night was great. And it's so th- thanks for all of your efforts and everything you've done um, thus far. Really appreciate it. So let me ask a little bit about where did music come from in your life? Do you have a memory of uh, the first time you remembered music or sort of a, a something that when, when you were young was just like, wow really hit you about music in your in your life because you're a guitar player now and a singer you do gigs around and do you have an early memory of, of music you know i think my my earliest memory where it really started sinking in was when i was in probably grade school um, my father had a, a fairly extensive collection of 45s um the good part about that or the bad part depending on how you land on music it was that most of it was country and western Hmm. and it was the old hard country and western you know buck owens and porter wagner and folks like that and so you know i think probably it's easy to say that that influenced me early on uh in in terms of enjoying music yeah. Um, did your I, parents play music? They they did not. They played the radio, and and um, my dad was quite good at it. We we would go on road trips, and <laughs> um, and of course I have a sister that's three years older, and she was into um, what I like to think of sometimes as uh, better music. Uh, you know, she loved the Beatles and and such, and and uh, honestly, I think looking back now, I I uh, felt like I was supposed to be the good child and so I was a big supporter of country music. I like to listen to country music. We'd go on trips and that's all we would listen to was Porter and Buck and and uh, um, And where were you growing up then? Uh, this was in southwestern Oklahoma uh-huh. and uh, out, in the, out in the sticks basically. Uh, grew up in a small town southwestern Oklahoma and and so you know, my music influence early on was this country stuff, and then I think secretly, uh, I don't think, I know secretly I loved the Beatles, and I loved um, some of the stuff that was coming out at that point in time, and, uh, you know, I can still remember kind of feeling guilty about listening to Herman and the Hermits, you know, it was <laughs> like it, was, it wasn't appropriate music, because my folks thought anybody that uh, um, had long hair was... Was suspect the, was the devil incarnate basically, uh. um, but a very conservative family and um, ironically I'm probably the least conservative person in my entire family and um, and so there, there's been a, a I guess a quantum shift there but but you know I I I think over over time I um, this love of music really came about because I was pitifully shy. Uh, I just didn't. I didn't hang out with a lot of people. I was a very private person. I spent a lot of time alone, and 
I think it was in the, um, maybe the fourth, no, let me back up. It was probably the sixth grade. Um, my cousin, who was at that point a year older than me, and he was like a, I thought he was a bodacious guitar player. Uh, I, I think he probably was. At least he had an expensive guitar. He had a Gibson <laughs> uh, Flying V at that point, uh, which I just thought was cool. And, and um, uh, I was given his one of his hand-me-downs, which was, uh, I think it was a Montgomery Ward's Silvertone. Uh, hmm. And it was the kind of guitar where the strings were, you know, an inch off the, the neck and if you played very long your fingers started bleeding and blistering <laughs> up. So and so uh but you know, I got this guitar and um shortly thereafter I don't know exactly when somebody gave me a chord book and uh the old Mel Bay uh, yeah, yeah. guitar one oh one uh chord book and I started figuring out chords. And then in the seventh grade or eighth grade I think my uh, my sister started dating a, uh, an airman. I lived in an Air Force town, and uh, his name was Ray Bradler. I'll never forget him. He, he was just a, I just thought he was the essence of cool. He played guitar. He played a lot of Elvis. He um, played more of a progressive country style of music, and he offered my parents to give me lessons. And, nice. Um, and so he basically gave me about two months of lessons about once a week however long it was until my sister quit dating him you know it was one of those things um and i learned some some basic chords you know i've uh you know basically i learned that that there's three chords in the truth you know it's uh the one four and five seven chord um and i can remember i think my earliest memory of of really feeling connected to the guitar and the instrument and uh, and everything was probably a, somewhere between the eighth and ninth grade. I um, learned Gloria, you know, G L O R I Gloria. Oh, yeah. And I would sit in my room, I know, literally for hours, and play that song over and over and over again because uh, it was three chords. I mean, it was real simple, and they were probably the easiest chords on the guitar scale, as far as I'm concerned. And um, play for hours, and I would just sing at the top of my lungs, and that's kind of where I, I realized that I loved to sing. That's uh, probably the first time um, in my young life that I realized that you know, actually, I, I think I have a voice, and I can hit pitch, and um, and so I um, played Gloria until somebody would come tap on the door and say, you know, do, do you mind learning something else? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and so, you know, that kind of, that kind of set my career, so to speak, in, in motion on, on music. And, and from there, I've been very fortunate. I had a music teacher in high school who I really think of as a kind of my father, uh, who, uh, recognized my vocal talents. And I was in varsity choir and I was, a uh, all state vocalist in in Oklahoma. And, Man, didn't know that. Uh, cool. Yeah, it was it was uh, interesting. I was a first tenor. I, you know, I don't know how I did that because I I do not have a first tenor's voice anymore anyway. Um, but I you know I had somebody that kind of tutored me and nurtured me along, and so I got out of high school and thought I'm going to be a I want to be a rock and roll star. I I'm well, you are kind music. of a rock and roll star. Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, uh, you know, I I majored in music. I, my first two two years of college was as a music major, vocal vocal music, and um, and I at that point in time struck out into the to the performance world. Uh, the performance world being uh, coffee houses and um, local restaurants that would hire musicians in the occasional bar where they had chicken wire up to protect the musician <laughs> or to protect the audience depending on how you looked at it <laughs> and uh, uh, and so I for the first um, out of high school for, for probably I don't know 12 or 13 years I 
in addition to earning a teaching degree and, and teaching, I was a full-time musician. I worked full-time, uh, five to six nights a week. Uh, I played the same place 11 months at a time uh, and, and developed a following in Oklahoma of some sort, I guess. What kind um, of music were you playing? Uh, you know, it was just uh, the, the traditional music of somebody who um, is lost, who is, is, um, has had their heart broken, um, you know, I did a lot of folk music like James Taylor or um, John Denver or the Beatles, of course. Everybody did the Beatles. Um, Gordon Lightfoot, mm-hmm. um, uh, Harry Chapin, probably one of the bigger influences uh, in my writing career uh, was Harry Chapin, oddly enough. Um, my stories, my songs tend to tell a story uh, from start to finish. Um, so, you know, my music was my outlet that was the only place that i felt confident uh, i can get in front of the crowd even to this day uh, even as an association person who has to address the membership at meetings and such and i'm just i'm just nervous as hell i mean it just balls me up um, but i can put a guitar in front of me and i'm like what's the big deal it's <laughs> nothing uh, it, it's uh, really really just kind of it has instills confidence or, or it's part it, of it's it all. does even on my worst day when i know my voice isn't right or i'm plunking chords out wrong or you know miss a finger pick here or there uh it's still like there's a confidence there knowing that not a lot of people can do that and and uh um and even fewer can do it well and i don't consider myself in the well category but uh i I, it, it's my, it's kind of my sanctuary. It's, mm-hmm. uh, it's a place that I can escape. Um, and, um, a guitar in particular, I, I took piano lessons a, a, several years ago, about 10 years ago with my youngest daughter and I liked it, but it was like, it didn't connect with me yeah. because all I could feel was the keyboard on my fingers and I could hear the music. And, and I knew what was good and bad. But with a guitar, it's up against your body, and, and um, your body kind of resonates. Um, and so I can listen to, um, I can play different guitars, and I have a, a, a rather large collection of guitars, and each one of them impacts me in a different way. It's the reason why I like them. It's the reason why I keep them, and it's the reason why when I write music, it, you know, sometimes it's, based on the instrument that I wanted to play that day. You know, I'll pick up a guitar and it's like, ooh, this, this is nice. I was, I was reading something, listening to something, as I do these days, about music, all the different kind of stuff. And somebody said, I wish I could remember to give credit, but like each guitar has something to tell you. It's, it's almost like, you know, you, you can learn, you learn from the individual guitar. You do. It. Uh, you play them differently. I. I can pick up. I can look at three guitars that, that that are, at least currently my favorite guitars, and that can change, by the end of the day. Uh, and I can look at them and say, when I pick them up, I'll place to start out with. I'll place something different, because that's what kind of resonates with me. Yeah. And I can. So I can say, well, play this one. Well, I got to get another guitar. It doesn't sound right on that one. Yeah. And so, uh, at least to me, I mean, I, it, it's just a really that's the that's the beauty of music to me as well. And guitar and vocals uh, is it such a personal thing? You know, nobody nobody can take it away from you. They can uh, they can not like what you're doing, but it doesn't matter if you like it. Uh, it uh, uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. Very profound really and consistent with the things that yeah, you know people uh, talk with me about i want to ask you a question because we were talking earlier about i think you were in a group of young people that went around <laughs> uh in your youth was that sort of in I, high school or it was a weird situation i uh, i was a um a ju- between my junior and senior year in high school um my mom and dad's uh, relationship was falling apart and you know the whole family was just kind of not doing very well at that time it just wasn't very healthy and um a young man up the street uh, who my folks 
really respected and respected their parents and stuff. He was kind of aware of what was going on, and he he came to them and said, "You know, why don't you have uh, Chef Stan come um, with me this summer to sell Bibles, uh, huh. sell Bibles door to door?" And so, um, and they, you know, it's like. My mom was all over it because my mom's a very spiritual, religious person, and she thought it would be a good experience. And my dad, I, you know, I, I think he probably didn't care. Uh, but but uh, anyway, I ended up going to Indiana and selling Bibles door to door. Um, and it, and on these, it was for the company called the Southwestern Company, and I'm sure they don't even exist now because books, you know, yeah. print books. Um, when you go off to sell Bibles, you find a place to live. Uh, you're kind of, and they teach you to live as cheaply as you can. And, um, you know, I spent a whole summer eating bologna sandwiches and um, drinking water and bologna sandwiches. It was a wonderful summer in that regard. But my, uh, the people I lived with uh, had a daughter and a son. The son was my age. The daughter was uh, three or four years younger. Um he was in a group called the Teen Ambassadors, and it was a it was a church group, and they got on a bus every I can't remember now. I think it was every Saturday, uh, but it might have been on Sunday. I, actually, I think it was on Sunday, and we would travel all over s- Southern Indiana, uh, just get up really early in the morning and get there for the morning worship service, and then we might stay for the evening worship service, or we would go to another church somewhere around there and we'd perform. And um, and so I spent summer selling Bibles and singing in this group. And it's it's interesting, you know, Jefferson. We we were just at the Up with People event, and I knew about them probably because of the Teen Ambassadors. Uh, this was in 1971, of course. Uh, uh, Up with People's five or six years older than that. But I remember hearing about them and thinking, there's no way that they're as cool as this group because, you know, it was that whole connection of music. You know, we were, um, to me anyway, it was a, it was the musical connection. It was the lifting our voices uh, in the same tones and the same rhythms. And, um, and of course, I was cool because I played guitar. And yeah. I got to play guitar with the group and do a couple of solos every once in a while. And um, I remember doing uh, Let It Be by the Beatles. And um, I, I had to agree to change the, the wording because it was mostly Southern Baptist evangelical groups that we were playing for. Uh, I couldn't say Mother Mary. I had to change the words to Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. And then it was okay. You know, the music was okay at that point. <laughs> but uh, uh, So it really, it, it, that, that people really uh, responded to teenagers coming oh, going around a- playing the music. And you were playing it, some... Bible thumping type yeah. church music. Well, y- yes, except when I was given a chance to play "Let It Be," stray off a little bit, and yeah. still, you know, do the performance part of it. And um, but but that's exactly right. There was that connection. Uh, everybody uh, didn't matter if, it, matter if it was a small group or a large group that was listening to this group of teenagers. Uh, the oldest ones were seniors uh, because that's when they went off to college, and it was a local local church that put this thing on um and so it was all young people and um 90 or so folks in the group and i mean man we you talk about making some racket it was yeah uh, it was really it was good 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 director i don't recall the person's name but um made some good music it was fun so let me ask you with this quite extensive uh lifelong experience with music playing different ways with the teen ambassadors guitar what is your perspective now on how music affects people whether they're the ones playing it whether the ones listening um you know when you're you play now you gig around uh, glenwood springs area the valley out there and i mean you see people listening all the time what sort of what are your thoughts about it how music affects people, whether they're playing or listening, or I—I I think it affects everybody, no matter what they're doing. Um, you know, if I—if I use just as an example, gigging at a, a local uh, establishment in the valley, um, 
there are people that are listening intently. There are people who are having conversations. There are people that are appear not to be listening at all. And, and what I've found is that um, I, I think 100% of the time, you still connect with music when you hear it. You, you, you can't help but connect mm-hmm. it, because it it's something that's, uh, it, you know, it's melodic, it's, it's, uh, it's rhythmic. Um, I think it sets the tone for how you, um, how you feel and interact with people yeah. in any setting. It can be a bar or a church or uh, it doesn't matter. It's still, I don't think anybody, even driving down the road listening to the radio, can not be impacted by music. Now, you might be thinking about a hundred different things and worrying about what you're going to do at work or you know what what's going on in your family's uh, life, but that music's still impacting you. And you know, I think the case in point is um, if you ask somebody about a uh, an important event in their life when they ask somebody to marry them or when they broke up with somebody or when a tragedy struck or you can ask them what were they were they listening to music and if they say yes i guarantee you um they can tell you what it was huh well that's interesting yeah. i mean I, I think that i think uh, I, I think of the catastrophic events in my life and the good ones and it's like you know I, I remember the music of the day. I remember it. Um, I might remember the song, but maybe not always. But if you ask me what was on the radio at a certain point in time, I generally can say, "Well, I was doing this, and this is what was what was on." And interestingly enough, I that's kind of impacted the music that I perform and how I write. Um, I'm I'm moved by um, the emotion of the moment. And, um, you know, a, a favorite song can be Fire and Rain by James Taylor, but it can also be uh, American Pie by Don McLean, or uh, it can be up or down, all of it, depending on if I'm listening to something, it's like, man, that, that's me, that's, that really resonates. And so I'll uh, uh, typically try to learn a music or pilfer ideas from for writing my own music. And so we have this uh, this venture that we've struck out on, and I, I kind of hijacked you a little bit, but I'm so happy that we do have this connection and relationship and friendship. You know, Planetary Gig Society, we've been talking about it. It's a little bit of th- ethereal, um, you know, making connections through music with the intention of bringing peace, which is sort of how I visualize it as a little bit of a long statement. It's kind of hard for people to get their arms around or their head around peace they understand war pretty well what that means but actually you know you can decide to go to war and people know what that means but if you decide to go to peace people don't necessarily know what you're supposed to do and i just think with the the power of music that you've been expressing that i've seen that the research is showing about that just seems so obvious to me um what are your thoughts on you know life we we got this crazy situation here in the states with uh you know our government and our president and and uh you know here we are trying to do a little something using music and i'm um, uh what are your, what are your thoughts about what we're doing <laughs> i think i think this situation we're in and and it's you know it's been a long time coming i i don't think it's it's um uh, it's happened since just happened in the last couple of years, or last since November of 16. I think it's certainly accelerating, unfortunately. But I think it presents a an opportunity for an organization like Planetary Gig Society because, um, you, you know, you mentioned peace, and 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 peace is a big word. It, it's uh, it, what does it mean? Well, it, it's inner peace. It's peace with your brothers and sisters. It's peace between countries. It's you know, it can be everything from the individual to the global and uh, I, I think that we have an opportunity as an organization to to spread that to spread that word that there are um, there are a lot of ways to accomplish um, how people get along with each other how we survive in a, in a, a world of constant 
and accelerating change and um, maintain peace. The whole idea of peace is, is to me, uh, uh, more of a, a vision because I don't know if it's something that can ever be attained, but I, but I think it can. And uh, but peace starts with the individual, and so uh, finding inner peace, being yourself. And I, I'm getting off the point, but I, I think we've got the opportunity to spread that word. And um, the the up with people um, evening last night really kind of solidified that for me. It's like you know this is. This is an organization that's been around for 50 plus years and they've got 20,000 alumni and um, they're doing really good things and they're barely moving the needle when you look at 20,000 people in context of a global population right. of how many right. billion. And um, so I think we've got an opportunity to help spread that word uh, about up with people and what they do. And I, man, I, I got to tell you, I hadn't, I hadn't really seen up with people until... Um, since probably 73 or something like that. Uh, I was totally blown away last night. It was uh, just absolutely mute, moving, moving music, and it made me want to go out and do things. It made me want to go out and change. So why can't we as an organization make people go out and do things? Yeah, them- I, and if we can believe we can make a difference is part of it. And, and uh, we had a little board meeting this morning, and... Uh, the the slogan or short mission statement that we came up with I used at the beginning of the podcast is creating unity through music and so thinking about that a little bit more and what you just said unity is sort of consistency it's a it's a it feels right it's it's together it's comprehensive it feels whole maybe and that is something that you feel when you play music we were sitting around playing here Good last point. night and I you know we'd finish a song and I'd just stop and say wow I feel I feel good I feel whole I don't feel pissed off or angry or I just feel really good and maybe that's that that inner peace and there may be another way to say that is inner unity or you know whole, wholeness of yourself and I do think that music helps bring that out in people it does uh, you know the bottom line is music almost forces unity uh, if you've got more than one person um, listening to something you've created a unified situation even if it's just hearing now you may we may be listening to a song and you may like it and I might not but at least it creates an opportunity for dialogue it creates uh, an opportunity for love and respect of music just you know music is just the unifier it's uh, I think it's pretty cool beans pretty pretty cool beans stuff. So. <laughs> well I don't know what else we would say after that music is pretty cool beans <laughs> um, let, let me just say that I, I really again appreciate your your friendship and your support and insight and you know we kind of connected right off the bat and over the telephone even and uh, I'm just very thankful for your taking the time to, to be here, to be talking with us. Uh, I think you said some really good things that helped me, and, and uh, hopefully we'll, people, people will listen and we'll you know, yeah. just keep, keep on out there doing what we can do to make things better. Yeah, and plan our next road trip. Yeah, next <laughs> road trip. All right, thanks very much, Mr. Stan or Dr. Strum. Really appreciate it. Thanks. You've been listening to Planetary Gig Talk, Tales of Music and Magic. I'm your host, Jefferson Glassy, Chief Spiritual Dude of the Planetary Gig Society. We talk with musicians and others about the power of music and how we can use music to help create a better world. Please check out our website, www.planetarygigs.org, for information about some of the organization's promoting music and musicians, resources about the power of music, books, movies, articles, including new research on music and the brain. We welcome your support. 
Planetary Gig Society is a Section 501c3 charitable organization, and you can donate on the website. You also can receive a free email signature block demonstrating your support for Planetary Gig Society. Please follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Planetary Gigs. And we want to thank fabulous musician and teacher Eric Weinberg of Little Eric Studios for the Planetary Gig Talk music titled Chill Kid, It's Saul. So please check out Planetary Gig Talk on iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. Subscribe and hear all the upcoming episodes. Thanks very much.